Welcome to Small Town Times. We have uh, Rod Biltz coming in. He's going to give us an update on all the different things he's been doing. Welcome, Rod. Oh, it's great to be back. Yeah, right on. Good to chat again. Um, right off the bat, I know you were at the Discovery Roads uh, meeting last night. Yeah, our annual general meeting was last night. Yeah. Um, so um, we were electing a few new board members mm -hmm. and uh, listening to hear from a number of the uh, trail partners in the across the region and some of the things that they've been doing as well. Um, and it was kind of interesting to see that uh, during COVID, a lot of people turned to the outdoors mm -hmm. and recognizing the value of some of these trail networks and things yeah, to yeah. do outside. And I think a lot of those trails with some of our partners maybe have been neglected for a little while and are in need of some some work. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the trail partners have kind of come back to the table now saying, We've got a lot of use now, but now we need a little bit of help to get things up to up to speed. So it was good to see the partners kind of come come back to the table again. Which uh, new board members uh, can you call? Uh, yeah, so uh, Melanie Elkins. Uh, yep, yep. So she's always been interested in outdoor stuff and and the yeah, she's got a lot of stuff going on. She does, yeah, yeah, and she'll be a good addition for sure. And another one is Dan Dorval, who's mm -hmm. a bit of a mountain biker and interested in trails. I've as seen well. his name somewhere. Yeah. Oh, He's involved in quite a few different things, and, and uh, he expressed an interest as well. So good to have a couple new faces on the board. And, yeah, fresh and, energy. Uh, yeah, and we launched our fundraising campaign as well last night, which is new for Discovery Roots. So. What, what's that for? So, I mean, it was identified in our strategic plan that, I know, Discovery Roots relies pretty heavily on government grants, mm -hmm. um, but it's not terribly st sustainable um, because from one year to the next, you never yeah. know what you may or may not get. So there's always been this wish to have some sort of a fundraising uh, arm of Discovery Roots to kind of create a bit of a base um, budget that mm -hmm. we can operate from. So we've launched our fundraising campaign called Connecting Communities. Oh, okay. And that really comes out of what was happening, just like I was saying during COVID, where people were really utilizing these, like the use probably went up over 100% during that period of time. And it also introduced a lot of people to outdoor activities that maybe didn't do them before and are now looking to maintain that. Right. Um, so there's certainly the the basis for uh, expanding our, our, our range and starting to uh, take a look at some of those trail networks and trying to fix and improve signage and things like that as well. Now, I know this, uh, the uh, Stepping Stone Trails, mm -hmm. they're, they're not part of the Discovery Road stuff or anything like that? Not officially, no. but they have sanctioned uh, some of the events there and so on oh, as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, and uh, you're uh, capitalizing on the popularity of that trail with a uh, fat bike rental? Yeah. So, I mean, again, during COVID, um, those trails were really kind of underutilized. Like, not a lot of people even knew they existed. But seemingly, the word got out during COVID mm -hmm. uh, when people were looking for places to go. And saw a huge increase in people just hiking, cross-country skiing, and fat biking on those trails. Um, and myself and a couple of the other local neighbors and had started to groom the trails to make them a little bit easier for people to use, mm -hmm. uh, which just increased the use even more. People were really yep. happy to see yeah. that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it became, um, much more, um, heavily used, I guess, and appreciated, which is great because they really are pretty spectacular trails for anybody that has not seen them. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I know the topic came up and probably some of the spotlight was put on because of the Algonquin uh, Treaty uh, situation and the possibility at one time yeah. wh where that was mentioned as up for development. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there was a bit of a sort of uh, uh, more talk about the trails, more appreciation and people saying use them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think because it had been sort of low key, yeah. it was it, we didn't really know how many people were using them or, or how much use they were getting. So I think paying a little bit more attention to that. And if indeed, you know, that is part of the, the claim, um, we want to be able to present to the Algonquins as well, like the value of those trails and that maybe they can do something with that as well. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, know, I've it, walked them. Uh, that That's tough build there anyways, right? It's uh, It would be for sure. Be challenging. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity there for the Algonquins to do something other than a development that could capitalize on that trail network as yeah. sort of the, the base. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful stuff there. Yeah, for sure. And um, you were involved with a couple of events as far as racing events, bike yeah, racing? Yeah, I, I guess back in 2021, um, we just kind of held a very sort of friends-only sort of an event, really. Yep. And we had, I think, maybe about 30 fat bikes that uh, did um, 
sort of not really a race. It's kind of a, a scavenger hunt more than anything. Right. Set out a bunch of stations in the forest. They're given a, a, a map and then they ride their bikes and try to get to each of the stations and get back as quickly as possible. And it turned out really well. A lot of people. And that was at the Laurentian. No, this no. was at Stepping Stone Trails. Oh, this is a Stepping Stone. That was the Stepping oh, okay. Stone Trails in 2021. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was quite successful and, and people really enjoyed it because mm-hmm. there's limited places to ride fat bikes, quite honestly, in our region. Right. Um, and then last year, um, myself and another cycling enthusiast, Connie Herget, I don't right. know if you know her or not. Yep. Um, she mentioned that um, um, to reach out to Mark Lyons, the Lyons family, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm guessing you're familiar with them. Yes. So Jack Lyons had passed away in mm-hmm. April 2022, and Mark was looking for some way to maybe commemorate his son and mentioned, you know, he knew that we had done this fat biking thing. He th- was wondering if we could turn it into a charity event and maybe expand it out. Oh, okay. So that's what we did last year, February 25th, actually 2023, this year, this yeah. past winter. And it was fabulous. It was, we had uh, 80 cyclists come out for the day. Um, I think we raised just under $15,000 that went to oh, wow. the um, One Kids Place mm-hmm. uh, to help sponsor parents uh, that have kids with autism that want to go to autism camp in the, uh, in the summertime. Um, so yeah, it was a great event and we just talked to Mark this week and we're going to do it again. Oh, yeah, right on. Did you pick a date or anything? We have not yet, not officially, but it'll probably be February 24th. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll pick a date shortly. And there was something about the Laurentian Trails you wanted to talk yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. So this is, I mean, it, it's been now 12 years since, uh, you know, there was a, the public meeting to talk about the future of those trails and how we're going to manage them. And also obtaining some sort of form of tenure over the trails because the the trails are actually sitting on a number of private lands as well, yep. as well as Department of National Defense lands. And uh, there was a couple environmental assessments done on the lands. Both the Conservation Authority did some and Department of National Defense to try to determine what those areas could support as far as trails. Um, that's been done but it's been a very long and tedious process mm-hmm. getting, they were looking to get, uh, it was the conservation authority that were doing the negotiations with the property owners and they were looking to get memorandums of understanding to allow for the trail system to exist in the hopes that the conservation authority would manage those trails. Um, there was some progress made, but it's been frustratingly slow. <laughs> mm. um, and I think there's also some concern. I know I'm concerned is that, that you know, people that don't really understand who owns those properties assumes that it's public lands and there's been new trails built and so on. Uh, my concern is that uh, we could lose the whole thing if uh, one of the uh, property owners says, you know, that there was unauthorized use. Right. So kind of wanted to get that solved. And we were looking for other options uh, to maybe secure those trails for the long term as an actual park entity or some sort of protected space. So actually Terry Perlin, I, I, yep. He, he mentioned to me, he said, you know, those trails are such a huge community asset. It's a shame that we don't have them under some sort of public ownership. And uh, so we made an effort and reached out to Anthony Rhoda for, uh, to talk about the DND lands and put a proposal together to get some sort of form of tenure over the portion that's on there. Um, and the defense minister was in North Bay actually just a couple of weeks ago. So he got that proposal then. And we've had some great feedback that they're, they want to do this. Oh. Um, and that, you know, we've, we've asked for like a 10 year lease at, for a nominal fee. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're looking to see if maybe the North Bay Mountain Bike Association might actually be the entity to actually manage the trails because they've proven that they can do a pretty good job with the yeah. Three Towers trails. Yeah, they have. Yeah. yeah. So, and they're definitely interested in doing that as well. And we've also reached out to the private developers that own the two fairly significant portions and, to try to negotiate either a land trade or some sort of a deal with the city, some, maybe a city property that they might want to trade in um, that they could possibly develop in the future because the escarpment properties have very limited development. Of, um, pr- um, potential? Yeah, potential the, the, because, the, because of the slopes and some of it is actually outside of the urban settlement boundary too. Um, so both of them have expressed an interest and in trying to set up a meeting right now to d- get that land trade done. Oh. So if we can get those three chunks, that's the majority of it. The other piece is actually owned by the city of North Bay. 
Um, and we'd like to see the whole thing get into public ownership of some sort under parks. And, and, and then we'll be able to see some investment going to those trails then. Oh, so a little bit of progress anyways. It is. I mean, uh, it's been sitting for a long time. And I mean, uh, I, Terry mentioned, and I think it's a great idea, you know, we've been planning some of the events for the upcoming 100th anniversary for North Bay in 2025. And he said it'd be really amazing if we could host an Ontario Cup um, mountain biking event at right. that facility as part of the celebrations for that year. And certainly the trails are of the quality and the size that we could do that, um, but we need to get some sort of land tenure on that uh, yeah. in order for it to happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, the, the biking thing is just blowing right up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's good to see like the the all wheel park that's now being uh, mm-hmm. designed, and and we've had some public consultation on that, and that pump track will also be like another component that uh, is attractive to cyclists that come to our area for yeah. sure. One more thing to do yeah, while you're here, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and things are coming together. Yeah. Now we just have to solve the homeless problem. <laughs> <laughs> now you're involved with. Uh, uh, with that as well, somehow. Yeah, so building blocks through yeah. building blocks, which is sort of a, a downtown corporation that's mm-hmm. uh, trying to make some improvements. And um, we recognize that before we can get sort of um, private investment to occur in the downtown and for local people to, again, feel safe to come downtown, um, that we have to make some changes. They're just mm-hmm. we, we just have to improve the system. And we spent probably the last year and a half almost two years now, I guess, trying to talk to all of the agencies involved, some of the people that are involved. Um, you know, I've gone out with the, um, the ambassadors to have an idea what their job's like and try to figure out, okay, what is it that's preventing us from getting this problem solved? Because it, it, it seems like it should be able to be solved. Um, and it seems like it's come down to a couple things, and some of them are legislative changes which were the tough ones to, to deal with. So we thought maybe from a private business perspective, we might be able to assist in that area because I know a bunch of the agencies have attempted this in bef- before and have not had great results from um, the, the, the federal uh, government and the provincial government. So we thought we would try and take that on and see if we could make some progress. And we have, <laughs> oh yeah, which is is great. So yeah, one of the things was uh, Bill C seventy five, which is a fairly recent change, has caused some serious serious issues as far as the escalation of violence um, in many municipalities, not just North Bay. And we've been seeing it here as well, where simple break and enters are now becoming assaults and getting a little bit more serious. Um, and you know the the changes that were uh, part of Bill C seventy five really allowed for uh, bail to become much, much easier, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing, except that we're seeing people reoffend and reoffend and reoffend, and things keep escalating, and it's neither good for the community nor the individual because it just gets them deeper and deeper into a hole. Yep. Uh, so it's not, it's not working the way they had hoped that it would work. Um, the other thing that we were concerned about is there is a diversion court system in Ontario so when there's a, a, a sort of a minor crime committed that's either related to mental health or drug addiction, uh, rather than going through the traditional court uh, judiciary process, there's a diversion court, um, which puts them into programming to either treat the mental health issue or help them uh, treat the, the uh, drug addiction problems so that they don't have a criminal record and rather than incarcerating them, which does no good, and then letting them back out on the streets to reoffend again, it makes no sense. Yeah. It's a very, very expensive way to deal with – it doesn't deal with the problem. That's yeah. essentially what happens. So that bill needs to be amended. And we met with Anthony Rhoda and, and I put a proposal together explaining what the amendments need to be. And it was very much the same as the Federation of Ontario – um, North, Northern Ontario municipalities had also put a similar resolution to Anthony Rhoda as well. And we've been told that this spring that those amendments are going to happen. So really pleased if that happens. That solves the federal level to some extent. Um, but it's not the whole story, unfortunately. <laughs> What's the other parts? Uh, the provincial yeah. section as well. So we spent quite a bit of time consulting with uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, mm-hmm. trying to dig in deep to find out What's the issue? Why are these people not getting the treatment that they require? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and consistently, you know, causing issues and 
you know, human rights code is certainly part of this because um, as it stands right now, if a person doesn't want treatment, they don't, aren't required to take, uh, have it. But with the bail system as well, we're seeing that escalation in violence because there there's, doesn't seem to be an accountability component to it. Um, so they, they said that they've tried to make changes to the Mental Health Act of Ontario and they haven't been successful in getting any interest in doing it. And there was a couple of things that they really wanted to change. And uh, one was actually just in the definition section to include drug, drug addiction as a mental health issue because right now they're separate things. Right. And certainly it has an impact on mental health, a big impact on mental health. So it, it kind of makes sense to do that. And then Section 20 of the Act is the part that allows a physician to involuntarily admit a person for treatment mm -hmm. if, they, if their health is declining and they're not capable of making a decision that would benefit their situation. I want to see some way of strengthening that so that physicians don't feel, um, I guess, scared from a, a human um, uh, rights component that they're not going to get into trouble if they, if, if they admit people for involuntary treatment. Right. Um, and then, of course, after that's all done, then you actually need the treatment facilities to do all of this. And we have to make sure that we have the capacity. So we've, we've met with um, the North Bay Regional Health Center, and uh, we believe the capacity is there. The problem is we can't get people into the system because of the way the judicial system is set up right now. Right. So if we get these two pieces of legislation changed, that should change the picture. And hopefully the agencies can look after the servicing part of it as well. Yeah, I was talking to somebody about that and the, the, you know, the splitting of the hairs between the mental health issue and addiction. Like, if you don't have a mental health issue that's identifiable before you get addicted to drugs, you right. certainly do have mental health issues yeah. after you're addicted to drugs Absolutely. because it rewires your brain and you can't make the right choices. You need intervention, right? right? Um, there's a lot of people that are against uh, uh, anybody being forced for treatment. Right. But this continuous cycle of and watching somebody until they spiral down to the last overdose, yeah, that doesn't work, right? No, you're just basically putting somebody on a, a a death sentence life support system. Yeah, right. So yeah, it doesn't feel like very humane treatment what we're doing right now, quite honestly. Yeah, um, because we're kind of like you say, kind of just sitting by and watching people decline until something serious happens. And then I, you had these serious discussions where people are like, well, um, just let them die then, yeah. right? Mercifully, uh, yeah. just stop keeping them alive if you're not going to help them, Yeah, right? That does cross people's minds. They do talk about it. I, I wouldn't, I would be more merciful with a, a pet than I would <laughs> with a person, right? Yeah. Like it just seems that way, yeah. right? And then... Once you get so far into the addictions, you, you, it's hard to imagine their ability to recover at all to any potential yeah. to be self-sustaining, yeah. right? You know, they, they have so many physical uh, ailments that come with addiction. Uh, they've taken years and decades off their life to begin with. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, no, it's interesting. And, and I think um, one of the things that really drove the point home, like we're in the process now with these two um, uh, legislation changes we want to try to get some uh, broad public support for this so we will mm -hmm. be going to like the dia chamber of commerce and other business people and and residents as well to try to support these proposals because i you know from it's a it's a political process yeah so they want to make sure that these types of things have broad political support as well so we will be doing that but i think one of the things that really drove the point home for me um certainly just being involved with the whole homeless network of uh, things that are going on in the city but I had an interview with a, a mom who has a son that has been in and out of trouble for a period of time. I guess she said that it really started when he was about 15 years old mm -hmm. and just made a simple little mistake that kind of put him down the wrong road. And she said that from that point forward, there, was, there seemed to be no assistance or no help available to get him onto the right track. And she said he's been incarcerated every year of his life for the last 20 years for a portion of every year related to drug addiction and, and mental illness now because the drugs have created this. And she's been pleading, could somebody please take a look at him, analyze and, and, and prove that he is incapable of making decisions for himself at this point so that we can save him before he either kills himself or somebody else. And it was sad because yeah. you could see it in her eyes that 
all this time, it, a simple intervention could have prevented this for this guy. And he's now 35 years old. And she said, like, I don't know if he's too far gone now to recover. Wow. But I'm sure her story is not unique. I'm sure no. there's lots of them just like that where a simple little thing that happened that put them down the wrong road could have been intervened early on and prevented all that suffering. Um, so that really drove the point home that that involuntary admission when somebody can't make those decisions for their own health is pre probably pretty important. Hmm. Yeah. Well, those are uh, tough rows to hoe, right? They are, but um, it's it's something that really concerns me personally, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that really impacts the city of North Bay, where, where I spent a lot of my time. And, you know, when you look at community safety and well-being plan and, and, and surveys show that 90% of the people in North Bay are afraid to be downtown, that's not a good statistic. We no. should, that should not be the case. And um, I don't want to place blame on anybody. I want to fix the problem. Right. I want to find out what is the issue, what is preventing us from solving this problem, and let's get it done. Well, I think you guys are on the right track of going to the root of the issue, which is uh, legislation that is conflicting with our social uh, um, wish list. Of Yeah, right? it's almost a little bit of reverse engineering where you're kind of looking, what is the end product we're trying to get to? Yeah. And do we have all the policies and legislation in place that are going to get us there? And if we don't, let's make those changes or else we're never going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel the same way. Wow. Yeah. Right. So you're a busy boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of nice because I'm more or less retired and uh, I enjoy doing community work mm -hmm. and uh, love to see if it benefits the community in some way as well. It's, uh, it's a great thing. And I, I mean, I really love North Bay. So it's, uh, you know, I, I want to see it succeed and I see so much potential here and, and we're just about there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right on. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the update. Um, I'm looking forward to our next interview in the spring where even more stuff is uh, yeah. addressed sure. um, and, and whatnot. And well, yeah, I went and said whatnot. <laughs> for, for three interviews, I've been trying not to say that oh, word. Oh, really? And the more I think about it, the more it I say it. keeps coming up. Yeah. yeah, it's a little thing somebody pointed out to me. And I'm, uh, do you have any of those little idiosyncrasies where you, uh, you repeat the same sort of phrase? I do. What was your... Uh, I say a bit, a lot. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I try not to, but you're, just like you say, it, it comes out before you even know it. Uh, well, I think if I keep talking about it every time it comes out, I'll eventually uh, catch myself beforehand. <laughs> Um, but this is good. I appreciate you coming in. Is there anything else we can talk about? Um, that's a lot that that's you a have lot on already. your plate. Yeah. Yeah. No, let's save it for another day. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, uh, please, uh, keep, uh, tuning in to Small Town Times. Uh, we'll be, uh, nicking away at all the different social issues eventually, and even some issues that aren't social, just something to, uh, talk about and feel good. All right. I'm on my deadline for the Back in the Bay magazine. If you're subscribing, Appreciate the support. If you're not, it's not too late. I'll get you the winter issue. It's coming out before Christmas. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. it. Awesome. All right. Cool. Short and sweet. Good. We covered I, the last half was perfect. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate that out um, and do uh, and, and use that in the newsletter. Okay. And I don't know. Have you been getting the newsletter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? How can I make it better? Uh, no, it's good. I really like. I, I and I mean, I watch all the videos too because I'm. Really interested in all of the uh, the people that you've been chatting with and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Yeah, it's really, really good. I like that. So.